All right. So now we will move on to the last uh, session for the day. The topic is Sigma Metrics in Clinical Lab. And it's a privilege to have with us Dr. Sujay Prasad. Um, Dr. Prasad has obtained his MD in Pathology from the Mumbai University and joined the Anand Diagnostics Laboratory thereafter in 1995. Dr. Sujay Prasad is the creative force behind the new innovations, technology initiatives, and business process improvements at Anand Diagnostic Laboratory. He's been instrumental in expanding the service capability of Anand Lab from facility expansion to acquisition of state-of-the-art equipment. And with his zero tolerance attitudes to errors, he has designed innovative methods that focus on minimizing errors across all the operating processes. He oversees the IIT initiatives and has implemented interesting IT-enabled ideas such as automated report uh, kiosks and online results reporting much ahead of the industry adoption. He's also a certified lead assessor for the NABL ISO 15189 accreditation and has conducted technical assessments overseas. A warm welcome to you, sir. May I request you to kindly begin the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, though I joined in a little late, I was fortunate to hear the last part of Dr. Harit's uh, talk. Uh, and like he rightly said, I think it was a lot of practical um, experience that he was sharing. Thank you, Dr. Harit, for that. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, take you through Sigma metric in lab medicine over the next 20 minutes. And this happened uh, because Dr. Suvin, thank you, Dr. Suvin, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, he asked me what I would like to talk. And um, I, I just messaged him, why not Sigma metric in lab medicine? So I would take you through these things. Why Sigma metric in lab medicine? An overview of applying Sigma metrics in lab medicine and sharing some e experience in pre-examination, examination, and post-examination. And then I will summarize before taking some questions. I hope I'll complete this in 20 minutes. If I'm not, please let me know and I'll certainly stop. So why Sigma metric? I think it's a good uh, measure of errors in the system. Uh, then the question comes, so what? So what if it's a good er er measure of errors? Um, the question then comes is, what is that one thing that we all look for in a lab? And I presume the answer would be, quality. Um, if that is the case, then how, how do we really, how do we define quality? And I think there are many definitions for quality. And it's easy for me to go through each one of them, conformance to specifications, fitness for use, continuous improvement. And for me, quality is the absence of errors in a predefined process, because that, that gives me a lot of handle and, and uh, direction to work on. And if that is the case, um, it, uh, our lab process across all the stages of pre-exam, exam, and post-exam are predefined. We pretty much know the SOPs for each of these areas. So we know the pre, they are predefined. And in that predefined process, we need to ensure that errors are as minimal. I am aware that it cannot be perfect. There, there cannot be an error-free situation at all, particularly in a busy lab. Uh, it's just that how much of effort is being made to reach uh, error-free state. So um, when we look at quality uh, in, in relation to errors, when errors increase, um, quality decreases. That is very evident. When errors decrease, quality increases. What we're actually doing is trying to identify uh, errors. And, and the biggest challenge is identifying errors. I think the next one is to record. If you're identifying errors, great. But if you're not recording them, a whole lot of opportunities are lost. Once we record them, we need to analyze, find a root cause, and take corrective action. But I think there's a bigger challenge, and that is fear of errors. Uh, as humans, we all fear errors. And if even there is a, an iota of fear, it is all possible that we may not be ident identifying the errors that are happening in plain sight. And if that happens, then we are in big trouble because it's not going to get recorded uh, and so on and so forth subsequently. So the focus is on errors and we have to identify them, record them, analyze them, find a root cause and eliminate. Because once you eliminate, you're, you're sure to experience a better quality or your customer is going to uh, experience a better quality. So quality is absence of errors and Sigma metric is a better measure of errors in the system. I like this book from 
Simon Sinek, start with why. And, and Sigma metrics is a better error, measure of errors in the system. And it's a better metric of quality. So I would think if it matters, we should measure it. Because if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. And this is not my saying, this is clearly the gurus telling these uh, statements, making these statements. They also make a very nice statement saying that nothing becomes more important just because you can measure it. It becomes more measurable, that's all. The flip side is once you measure it, you kind of know where you stand. And if you're proactive, you would want to take, a, take action to improve yourself if you're not doing all that great. So errors happen across the laboratory process, whether it's pre-examination, examination, or post-examination. And in the examination uh, phase, there are two aspects. One is the analytical errors, which come out of, uh, say, uh, chemistry analyzer. And there are process errors within the analytical phase, which are not kind of quantitative in nature, but they are process nevertheless. And both pre-examination and examination, post-examination are process errors. So how do we really look at these aspects? Uh, like I mentioned, it's very important to re record errors wherever there's a process, predefined process, we need to record errors. If there have been um, activities that don't meet the specifications. And in the case of analytical errors in the examination phase, I think we have a nice QC analysis, whether it's internal or proficiency testing. So how should we apply the Sigma metric in a clinical lab? I think this, um, I'll, I'll relate it to these two aspects. If it's a process error, I think we should be using the defects per million process Sigma table. And that could be a table that is used with, with the nomogram with short-term process Sigma and the long-term process Sigma, or we could use a nice calculator, which can be got from the Westcard website where uh, we enter the number of defects or number of errors that we have recorded. Um, and the next field is where we look at the size of the sample or the activity that we do. How, how I'll give you an example of this. I'll make it a little more simpler in the slides that are coming in the next few slides. Um, in analytical errors, there's a nice uh, equation, a formula. Sigma is uh, total error allowable minus bias divided by CV. All, all of these should be in percentage. If they are not in percentage, if total error is allowable is an absolute and bias is an absolute, please use SD in the denominator. So why is it called Six Sigma? I think this, I was co completely confused when my journey into Six Sigma started. Um, it was interesting uh, how I learned this as well, because uh, when we run Q quality control, internal quality control, multiple times, say 30, 60 times, we get, we don't get all values at the same, uh, in the same concentration, but it gets spread over what we call the Gaussian curve. And that's the test value. And that's not necessarily the true value. The true value resides elsewhere. The distance between the true value and the test value is the bias. Whereas this dispersion around the uh, values that we run on a daily basis is what we call as the CV. Now we have the bias, we have the CV. We cannot measure our sigma till we predefine the process. When I say predefine the process, we have to set tolerance limits. And that's where it is total error allowable. These are international guidelines that provide analyte specific total error allowable values that we need to put. Now, the distance between the nearest distance between the test value and the total error allowable is what is called the sigma. Now, if there are six sigma or sigma is, uh, SD is a mathematical expression of sigma. So if there are six standard deviations between the test value and the nearest total error allowable, it's going to be called a six sigma situation. So coming to total error allowable, I think uh, there was a Stockholm consensus in 1999, which provided five uh, levels of uh, total error allowable, but that got uh, revised in uh, 2015 at Milan 
and Milan hierarchy provides only three, fortunately. The first one is the most difficult one, and that comes out of clinical outcome. Um, one of the examples I can give is uh, HbA1c, which is uh, very rigorous in its uh, uh, quality. And uh, the second best is biological variation data derived goals, popularly known as RICOS goals, which are currently quite uh, uh, a lot of discussion ha happening there, controversial as well. And the last one is everything else, or the best of the state of art, where regional proficiency testing uh, programs have uh, developed their total error allowable limits. For example, the Royal College of Pathologies of Australasia and CLIA really back, all of them have their own regional limits. So if I look at the same uh, picture that I showed earlier with five sigma, I'm going to use the three levels from Milan hierarchy. The first level is the most difficult and the total error allowable is uh, at, at a very tight one. You would observe that with the same bias and the CV, the sigma is 3.5 sigma. But if I choose to use the second level, that is the biological variation database, that's a little more lenient, and then I would achieve a better sigma. And if I you go to the lowest level of the Milan hierarchy and apply the third level, I think I would achieve a far better sigma metric. Now, there is no hard and fast tool that you need to use only the first level. Three levels are provided so that there is flexibility for the lab to choose the right um, total error allowable, at least achieve four sigma with the lowest level. And uh, if you have achieved four sigma at the lowest level, I think the labs uh, should put in the effort to go to the second level, second uh, to, uh, total error allowable, and try to achieve the four sigma at the second level. So some rules of thumb, this is from Archives of Pathology 2000, three sigma performance is considered the minimum for any industrial process. Typical performance of business and industry processes is considered to be around four sigma, and this goes for healthcare as well. The first goal of a Six Sigma project in business and industry is usually to improve from Four Sigma to Five Sigma. This is in fact a very significant improvement and a very difficult one because it's a hundredfold reduction in the defects in the short term. Some processes never reach Six Sigma. And I think we all have come across this, but reaching Five Sigma may be good enough. In some cases, the process can be re-engineered to achieve Six Sigma. So, uh, sorry. Uh, when you look at uh, the, again, the same article also showed uh, the processes, how they compare. And these were Q probes, um, order accuracy, duplicate test orders, uh, and various activities. And you would see the Sigma process uh, in under all of them. And you see the TDM timing errors is 2.2 Sigma, which is pretty low. And I'm sure all of us have faced this where the therapeutic drug monitoring, the sample timing has always been a challenge for each one of us. So what I will do is I'll try and see if I can take you through um, the examples of pre-examination, examination, and post-examination. In the pre-examination, we all know that uh, there can be registration errors, first pass phlebotomy situations, turnaround time, labeling errors, and wrong anticoagulant. I'm not going to go into all of them. I'll just take one, and that's registration errors. And in the registration errors, there could be demographics, billing details, and test orders. I'm not going to go into all the three. I'll just take the demographics. For example, if there have been a total registrations of 81,487 in July 2020, the errors in demographics have to be understood, and defects per million uh, or, or try to understand what is the total uh, potential for errors in that system and finally calculate the sigma. So uh, in the demographics, we generally record name, age, title, doctor, and client. I may have been, I may be missing out some, but I'm, it's only for illustration purpose that I'm uh, providing these um, things here. So there are five elements in demographics that can go wrong. 
and there are 81,487 registrations in July. So when you multiply them, we get four lakh and odd opportunities where errors could have happened. Now, that's the total number of opportunities. So now let's look at um, total number of opportunities is 4,7435. The errors that we have recorded in our non-conformance recording software for the month of July 2020 is 11,009. That converts to a defects per million of 27,020. And when we take the chart, the sigma conversion chart, we generally look at the short-term sigma. Uh, and when you look at the equivalent there, it's somewhere around 28,717. I think it would be somewhere between 3.4 and 3.5 sigma. And if you put it that in a calculator as well, I, you'll get a, a good number of 3.5. Now, 3.5 is not good, actually. 3.5 is less than 4. And so the confidence in that entire process is not that great. So what do we do? We actually drill it down to understand which of those is contributing to the maximum um, or the lowest sigma. If you look at the kind of selection of doctor, it's 3.3 sigma, which is uh, the lowest. And I'm, there ha all the sigmas are less than four. So there is a need to improve sigma, uh, meaning uh, error reduction in all the areas. And we kind of have brought in a software that captures which is the staff that is making errors in these uh, demographics. Because if there's a change in the name from say Sujay to Sanjay or Sanjay to Sujay, we know that the person who first registered has made a mistake. And we presume it may not be 100%, but we most of more often than not, it's the staff who has made that error, uh, whether due to distraction, loss of attention, uh, it could be any of those, but it clearly shows that the errors have started to creep in. And we on a first week of every month, we provide them a scorecard with, with the Sigma metric um, for their own activities. So we can provide Sigma metric for the parameters and we can give it to each of the staff that are in that area of activity. So Sigma metric can be applied in pre-analytical and post-analytical process. Um, it's important to get the total number of opportunities that may reside in that activity and uh, find the number of defects. That's very important. Like I said, identifying the error, recording the error is very important. If we don't record the error, then we are missing opportunities and we would not be even, uh, we would not be able to measure our sigma. So use the sigma conversion table or the sigma application and calculate sigma and identify areas of low sigma. Because once you identify areas of low sigma, that's when you have a quick action point. Um, so I said sigma uh, SD or sigma is the mathematical symbol for SD. And, and this is the sigma calculation. So now when you look at each of these numbers in an uh, examination phase, the analytical part, we have mean standard deviation, CV bias, total error and sigma. All of these are lab achieved. But for each of them, except mean, you really have guidelines that can be set. And these are coming from, say, a back calculation for SD. Um, or it could be any of the three levels of the Milan hierarchy for CV, bias, and total error. And clearly for sigma, we all know that it should be more than four. So I'm taking an example of glucose. Uh, we have had um, 58 uh, measurements uh, of level one and 55 of level two for July 2020. The mean uh, is there, the standard deviation is there, the CV is provided there, the bias, uh, by only through luck, it has just happened to be zero. Uh, total error is bias plus 1.96 times the CV. And uh, there are disadvantages of looking at total error alone, but I would still go with only sigma. Uh, total error allowable is coming from the guideline. Uh, this is biological variation desirable. And then we calculate the sigma, which has come up to 10.875. That's primarily because um, the 
the CVs are pretty low, uh, 0.55 and 0.64, and the bias uh, is zero because uh, we achieved 129 milligrams per deciliter, and our peer group also achieved 129. That makes it zero on the numerator, and that becomes zero as well. Um, so we use the total error allowable coming from the biological variation database uh, desirable from Milan hierarchy. Uh, you could get this uh, table from the website, Westcard website, or even otherwise. EFLM also provides a desirable specification, which is slightly different from the recourse guidelines. Um, you could use that as well. So when we put this uh, into a uh, formula, we would get a sigma of 10.2. Now, everything is not as rosy. Cholesterol, for example, we've had a bias of five. Uh, and the sigma of 2.7. Clearly, uh, the total error allowable is nine. Even though it is nine, we have uh, nine minus five, that is four, divided by 1.5, which is definitely less than three, which is 2.7. So this clearly indicates to me that we need to work on our cholesterol. Uh, when we, what we need to do once we have understood the concept of uh, sigma, it's good to do it for all the parameters that we have in our scope, particularly the quanti quantitative ones. The qualitative ones will have to approach like the way I showed it in the pre-analytical or pre-examination phase. When we did it for our hematology parameters, uh, clearly, I think our PT and PTT and platelets all had low sigmas. And we had to uh, uh, work on that. Like I said earlier, if we feel that we cannot achieve uh, four sigma at uh, biological variation, that is the second level of Milan hierarchy, we can certainly go down to the third level. And if when we apply the third level, you'll see that the PTT has achieved a 5.3 sigma, which makes gives some confidence. PT is still below four, WBC is below four, but platelets has reached above four. So please do not start with the level two. You can go with level three and try to work yourself or work upwards to achieve better sigmas uh, with uh, higher levels of Milan hierarchy. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Sujay, sir, we have one more minute left. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. I'll then quickly go through. This is post-examination. I think I'll skip this as well. Critical alert manager, we measure our sigma and we saw it was 2.1. So it was clearly an opportunity for improvement. So we started to work on how we improve our sigmas for the post analytical. So in summary, sigma metric is a good measure of error. It can be used to measure performance in all three phases. Understanding sigma metric and its application is important before implementation. CV and bias are essential components of sigma metric in an analytical phase. Understanding total error allowable is fundamental to measuring sigma. Once understood, it is easy to apply. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujay, sir. It was indeed a very interesting session. Uh, sigma metrics is a topic that I think it's high time we all need to understand and make use of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and unless data is, you know, captured and analyzed and we make use of it, we will not really be able to understand the opportunities for improvement. Wonderful presentation by you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you.